car or in a, in a, a motor coach or what have you, you can't go, you know, a mile without passing something medieval. I mean, it's, it's amazing whether it's, you know, the ruins of a round or a keep or an old abbey or something. And um, the, I, the one thing that I would say about putting together a tour though, is besides the history, I would also see if you can find one that covers folklore, because that just makes it even more, especially if you like uh, you like the romance of these countries, um, the folklore just makes it uh, deeper and richer for you, for you. Um, you know, whether it's fairies or whether it's um, the, the, the romance of a conquest or uh, whatever, whatever makes your, you makes you breathless. So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you, um, Hilly. Okay, glad I jumped in there. Um, my, uh, I've traveled to England and stayed there a long time. And then I went to Scotland and fell in love. And I, ha I made friends. Uh, somebody just suggested that I go to this small village in the Highlands and it's in Plockton. It, and it's, I, I think maybe there's a hundred residents there, but I loved it. And my friends, Calum and Jane McKenzie have a bed and breakfast there. And if you stay at their um, bed and breakfast, I got up the first morning after I got there on a rainy night and I opened the, my bedroom window and looked out and there was a lock and then the backdrop of the Highland Mountains, they were misty that morning and Sterling Castle was right there. And I just stood there at the window going, I can't believe this is my life. It was amazing. And so I reckon it, it's a must go to. You have to go to Plockton in the Highlands of Scotland, stay at my friend's the Mackenzie's house. You could take a, um, a friend of theirs, um, Kenny McLeod, <laughs> this drives you around and he took me to the Isle of Skye and a couple of other places to go look at different things. And I mean, hands down, inexpensive, fun. You won't ever want to leave. There's two three pubs you can hang out at. <laughs> there's not that many people, but there's plenty of pubs. <laughs> so definitely have to go there. I, I am going back because I just fell in love with it. When I was leaving Flockton, we were, there was five of us, I think, with me included. And we were on the train and I was so upset that I didn't get to say goodbye to Calum. So as the train was leaving Flockton and go, taking us to the train station near Inverness, we looked out of the window and there was a little... Um, inlet from the lock, Lock Karen, and there was Caleb and his friend Ed, and they're waving this big old flag for us to see, and we all just started crying. So, yeah, love Scotland. All right, how about uh, Carolyn? I don't have a lot to add. That's amazing. I'm getting, I'm going to get Hildy to send me the address so that I can go visit. We were also talking about going this summer and of course it has not happened and it will not happen, but maybe Hildy, maybe I'll tag along with you when you go back. Um, I have never been to Scotland. I have spent a while in England. I have been to Ireland. Um, I know what I want to do in Scotland, and it's the same thing that I want to do no matter where I go, and that's to go find some nature and sit in the middle of it and smell it. I mean, you know, but like that's, it's, it's, I'm an, I like going out, I'm an outdoor girl. I like, I like writing about nature. I like setting my scenes in nature. Um, I want to know what kind of tree it is they're sitting under. I want to know what the forest floor feels like. Um, I want to know what scents are in the air, um, that sort of thing. So that's, I mean, if we're talking about creating some kind of tour book, it would be important for me to go to have a picnic on the shores of Loch Ness or whatever, you know, like that. Whoever's putting this together, put that down as something I want to do. I think we all need to go together. Could you imagine how amazing okay. that would be? That would be <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> uh, Catherine. Um, I have been to England, I've been to Wales, and like Marianne say, said, Wales has the most capital, uh, most castles, like, per, per capita of, of any country in the world, and um, it is called the land of castles for very good reason, and I found Wales absolutely fascinating. I, I just thought it was such a, a mystical, magical, lush country, um, country and 
when we went there, we stayed at the Hilton Cardiff and it overlooks Cardiff Castle, which is this massive, beautiful, gorgeous Norman, you know, has Norman keep and, and it's also got an 18th century addition to it, which is just really, really beautiful. And um, when we checked into the hotel, our um, hotel room was on the opposite side. So my husband being the liar he is, he went to the front the front desk and he, he says, you know, this is our honeymoon trip and, and, and we'd really like it if we could have a castle view. I mean, he made up this whole thing, you know, I was dying, you know, I don't know, all sorts of stuff, crazy stuff. And they gave us a suite that overlooked the castle. And I sat there like well into the early hours of the morning watching that castle at night in the dark. I mean, it was just, God, it was magical. It was just absolutely magical. And then we went there the next day and it was incredibly magical. But I'll tell you what's interesting about a lot of these keeps, and I'm sure those of you who have been there kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know how more people didn't like break their necks and kill themselves on the stairs and stuff because not only are they steeply pitched, they're really narrow, they're made out of stone, they're slimy as hell. So here I am, you know, going up and down these stairs. And I think at one point we were at, I want to say, Chepstow Castle. And I ended up going down a spiral staircase on my butt because I was afraid to stand up. So I'm like, I'm like flying down on my butt. But, but what a great experience and what a great way to kind of indoctrinate yourself into the lives of medieval people. I mean, holy cow, it, it, it wasn't easy. But it was a hell of a lot of fun. So I would love to go back to Wales and explore more castles. I would love to go to the north of England, which I have not been yet. Um, so, yeah, England and Wales are definitely on my on my hit list. Scotland, um, I'll get there at some point. But but I'm really, really, really want to go back to England and Wales. So my favorite place. Thanks. Um, CD. Hey, everybody. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> So I've never been to England or Scotland or Ireland, and I'm very sad now because I really want to go. <laughs> uh, especially you just want to you want to lick the castles. I want to lick the castles. She does. She lick the stone. Slide down the spiral staircase on my butt. This on great. your butt. Yeah, you do. This is awesome. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, in uh, I do set my werewolves. They come from a very real county in Ireland, County Tyrone. In a very fake town that I made up called Valley McIntyre, which basically means Valley of the Wolves. So that's kind of cool. I would love to see if it matches, you know, my imagination and the pictures I saw. So I would definitely put that on my bucket list as a place to visit. It'll probably you know, after, exceed it. Yeah, I imagine it would. I mean, yeah, it does sound incredible. Hey, thanks. Um, I think I saw another question about conflicts um, in regards to a lot of wars going on in the UK, all over Scotland, Wales, Ireland, England. Um, so do you find that makes it easier to write your stories, having all of this ingrained conflict? Ingrained conflict in the past, you mean? Yes. Um, so I, one of my series is, is set during uh, the reign of Robert the Bruce. And there's lots and lots of series out there set in the reign of Robert the Bruce. Yeah. Uh, because we have this fantastic, as Marianne said, ingrained conflict that's, that's already there that we can write about um, for over hundreds of years. But Robert the Bruce is... It doesn't matter. We don't. It's not here for history lesson. Um, so it's it's useful. It's handy that it's there. Um, we have how many how many books out there? You know the the Scottish laird and the English heroine. You know, and they they're enemies to lovers. That's a fantastic. It's a built-in plot point. It's it a really built -in is. Plot point. Yeah. Yeah. It's not all of the. I mean, not all of our books revolve around that kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. But it's handy. <laughs> it is. It's very I, handy. I, I used, I used um, religious conflict um, in a couple of my books. In Condemned, um, like I said, it had, took place at the, in the Crusades. But also in my, uh, my book, uh, Blood Legacy, 
it was um, the Inquisition, you know, which is, oh, you know, yeah. medieval times, but, you know, it, it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty dark time in history. And I think dark times in history, no matter what era they take place in, automatically give you conflict. But there's always going to be people who want to fight on the opposite side and fight the, the, the tyranny and the, the impolitic cruelty that happens, um, you know, when, uh, when one side tries to subjugate another. Um, and I, I mean, I've most of most of my legend series, and the reason why it's called legend series is um, because it takes place in New York, in the in Sleepy Hollow, in the Sleepy Hollow country, which is basically where I'm from. And uh, so, I mean, even even as, as short ago as 200 whatever years ago, there was conflict, and I use that in in Time Turner because I have a character that goes back in time to 1780. And it's the whole conflict between uh, Benedict Arnold trying to sell us down the down the pike to uh, to the Brits. So, you know, darkness just lends itself no matter which era. I think you make a really good point, though. It's not necessarily political conflict. It's conflict with religion. And I have written about, you know, conflict with the Catholic Church many, many times. As a matter of fact, this book right here is called The Dark One, Dark Night. It's all about um, divorce. Basically, and it didn't happen back in medieval times. It just it just wasn't a thing. So that book really makes the Catholic Church out to be um, the bad guy. The Catholic Church is literally my antagonist in this book. And, you know, I'm sure it made a lot of like Catholics very uncomfortable, but, you know, too bad, so sad. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> by the way, Levesque means the bishop in French. It, it's, you know, entrenched in the Catholic Church. So um, I'm not a Catholic hater, trust me. But in, 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 in no, the book, but the church has a long and complicated oh, history God. and it's absolutely. just interwoven everywhere. I mean, absolutely. And especially in, in, in the Middle Ages, I mean, they were really they really had a grip on the population. Yeah. And, and they were I mean, they were like all in your bedroom. They were all in your personal life. I mean, they were everywhere. So, yeah, they are definitely the antagonist in several of my books. Yeah. Well, 2000 years of history, 2000 years plus of history will you know, give birth, give birth to despots and autocrats and, you know, might makes right and so forth, even if it's hiding behind the guise of a cross, you know? Yes. Oh, absolutely. No. absolutely. I mean, I yes. You know, I pissed off a lot of people with this book. So, <laughs> but, yeah. Hey, it's fiction, Hi. people, but still, it's true. Hildy, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I was going to say that in my books, especially in this series, I'm not, I am using more, but I'm using more between clans. And one of the things about uh, medieval Scotland was that the clans were always at war, whether it be over territories, encroachments, the bigger, more powerful clans trying to, you know, take the smaller clans underneath and subjugate them under their, you know, their their rulership, I guess. So I, um, I enjoyed doing a lot of clashes between clans because I, I think that was happening a lot. I do have in one, uh, one of the stories where people are coming back from uh, fighting with the, against the English, against Catherine's Knights, I think. And they were, <laughs> they were coming back and there's this clan clash going on. But they, what happened lots of times, it was more of a uh, show of force. So they would show up and camp out. <laughs> I don't have a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> And so they, uh, so anyway, I wrote this scene where they're kind of camped out and they're waiting, you know, kind of in their mission, I guess, whatever it was between battles. And these guys were coming back from fighting the English and they just kept right, riding by. They're like, yeah, that's y'all's fight. We're tired. We're just going home. So. <laughs> CD, do you want to add anything? Um, well, in my historical fiction, it was two werewolf clans, actually, Irish clans who are fighting. And, uh, you know, the conflict is there. It's always there. And I think the religious aspect is great because it does spur it on. What I did in my thing, because it took place during Queen Elizabeth's reign, which I thought was cool because, you know, I didn't really like her <laughs> up in Ireland. No. <laughs> so I found it you know, fun to have the, the characters comment on that, uh, just like they did with the church. And it was great, you know, was, it, the research was great. It was there, it was, you know. All right, great, thanks. 
Um, so I'll go back to my list of questions and I'll ask, um, what is the biggest challenge when writing historical fiction? And um, I'll go back to Marianne. Um, the biggest challenge for me anyway, is um, taking the historic fact or facts of a era or um, an event and fictionalizing it and trying to stay as close to the correct history as possible with still being able to fictionalize it. So, you know, I don't take tremendous creative license and change history, his, you know, tremendously. Um, I kind of weave what I can. And then at the back, I put in my afterward, I always put the, the truth of things. Like um, in uh, Time Turner, right here. Um, in Time Turner, there, that this takes place, like I said, in 1780, um, where my, my, main, my character is thrown back in time and um, she's, wit she's a witch. So she gets thrown back in time because ancestors have called her and blah, blah, blah. But um, I did some research and back in the day uh, during the Revolution, American Revolutionary War, there were spies that were part of the Culper spy network that worked for George Washington and um, uh, 355, I believe it's 355, I don't know, it's been a while, um, was the code word for a woman spy. And there were a bunch of them. There was Anna Strong, um, she was on Long Island. Um, she, uh, you know, she used to hang out black uh, petticoats and, uh, and uh, white handkerchiefs. And those, depending on the number of each, would tell the, the patriots where they were having their secret meeting or where, where there was gonna be a blockade or a surprise attack or something. But um, there was a, a female spy who to this day, they don't know who she is. So that was where I was like, oh, there's my entry right there into fictionalizing my character being thrown back in time and not knowing, you know, and, not, and them not knowing who she is because she wasn't supposed to be there. So uh, nothing gets up my nose more than watching a TV show um, that's histor supposedly historically based and then having them get it so wrong because they just, Hollywood just doesn't bother, you know, and the, te and the temporal line, you know, the timelines are just off. You know, or you know, I don't care if it, if the buttons are wrong and things like that. I'm talking about the actual history. Like in the in the Tudors, they killed off um, Henry VIII's bastard son um, uh, at three years old when he really didn't die at three years old. He you know he was the son of Emily Blount, and you know he died when he was much much older. But they killed him off of the sweats when he was three just for creative license, and that irritates me. So, you know, I, that's just me. But it, that's the, my answer is to try and stay as, as, as historically correct while trying to fictionalize the story. So. Thanks. Hildy? I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the, the biggest challenge when writing historical fiction? Oh, yeah, yes. I think my biggest challenge is the fact that historically speaking, the way women were treated, we can't write because we will get in trouble with the readers. And so lots of times when we yes. want to have strong women, we want to have women that are feisty, but you know, they wouldn't get away with half of what we have them getting away with. And sometimes like, I, I know there's like a scene in, High, in uh, Outlander where she, he had a beater or a, pop around the butt or whatever and people got so upset and I'm like you know honestly yeah that, we're, we have to soften that and so lots of times I have to pull my heroines back a little bit because to show face especially in the in the highlands back in those times the husband would have been asked to you know beat your wife to because of what she did she disrespected you in front of everybody and lots of times they want heroines to be spicy and come out and speak their way their truth and you know put them in their place but you you, you can't always do that but at the same time you can't show that that the other guys would be like you know she disrespected you how are you gonna you know make her punish her for that and we can't write it I think that's my biggest challenge. Not that I want to beat women or anything like that at all. <laughs> but I just, <laughs> I just think that we have to kind of rein in a little bit and not be as truthful when it comes to certain things. <laughs> all right, Caroline? 
Um, I I would agree that that is an issue, but I go in the opposite direction. My policy is if you, unless you can prove that this absolutely never happened in any instance, then I'm going to say it could have happened. I have a, um, the, this series behind me right here um, is my Highland Angels series. And it features a trio of women in Queen Elizabeth the Bruce, um, her, her court. So Robert the Bruce has become king. He's off gallivanting around, keeping his kingdom intact. And he leaves Queen Elizabeth um, at home to have babies, basically. We know we nothing know. about Queen Elizabeth. It drives me bonkers. We don't even know when her daughters, the royal princesses, were born. How, how terrible is that? Okay, but that means that we can make everything up that we want. So I gave her a trio of ladies in waiting who are secret agents. Um, and they're the highlight, they're the angels, the queen's angels, and they go on this fantastic mission to save the country, etc., whatnot. That's because I write badass heroines. Okay, like I'm willing to admit that there probably weren't that many secret agent ladies in 1320 scone. But unless you can prove that there were zero, yeah. I'm going to write about one. Caroline, you'd be surprised. <laughs> that's, the, no, that's what I'm the, saying. It's, the philosophy it's like, is that yeah. the men would speak in front of the women because basically yes. more furniture. So, mm -hmm. or didn't have the brain power to understand what was going on. So more power to you because I did the same thing in Time Turner. I had her, I had her use her, her spot while she was kind of sitting in the room, you know, needle pointing or whatever and listening to everything that they said and they planned and then going back and doing something about it. So yeah, good girl. <laughs> well, I have my three, uh, you know, I've got the, the badass, you know, bow and arrow wielding spy. I've got the, the sexy one who uses her, her feminine wiles to get the information she needs. And then I've got my intellectual, you know, it's, it's the typical trio series, except I put it in kind of an interesting place at an interesting time. Bruce's Ain't <laughs> Great instead of Charlie Angels. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying that, but I'm not not saying it either. <laughs> I I can't come out and say that's what I based it on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Catherine? You know, it, it's interesting listening to everybody talk about this because I, I whole, wholeheartedly agree with everything pretty much. Um, you know, what I wrote 30 years ago is so different from what I write now as far as the historical accuracy where it pertains to women because, you know, you, you can't write bodice rippers anymore. You really can't. You can't do it. You know, everything has to be consensual. Everything has to be on an even keel. So it's, it's a real challenge to to write historically accurate women, you know, in a way that, that the modern reader will go, yeah, she's great, she's strong, she's wonderful. But, you know, a lot of the women weren't. They, they really weren't. And, and, you know, we're touching upon it here, they were chattel, they were furniture, and, and especially in medieval times. That being said, there were examples, historical examples of very strong women, women who owned their own businesses, women who, when their husband died, took over his trade, managed his business, you know, that kind of thing. So, so there really were a, a whole group of underlying women that were very, very strong um, in medieval times. But for me, the historical accuracy challenge is, and, and every one of my books has incredible historical you know, real historical events mingled with fiction. But what I do is, is whenever I take creative license, I always have an author's note in the beginning of the book that says, this has actually happened. This person is not real. This person is real. This castle is real. This isn't, you know, so I'm, I'm very clear and I'm very transparent with it. Um, you know, as far as women's behavior and, and women um, managing a, a husband's business or that kind of thing, I also put that in there too, because, because I think part of our duties or part of our responsibilities as historical romance fiction authors is to educate the readers. You know, they read these books because they love history. So, you know, let's have them learn something about it. So, you know, I, I'm pretty clear when things are, are I've taken artistic license or not, but um, 
you know, I, I really like blending everything. So it's, it's not, it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge, I think. So I enjoy it. But yeah, hey, Caroline, yeah. who's to say that there really were not three female spies? I'm telling you, unless you can prove exactly. to me that they weren't there, they were there. And if you and that's the case for me for any of the yeah. history, any time that I have a, a reader say, "Well, she wouldn't really have done that," or "That How wasn't really accepted," and I yeah. and I always say, "Unless you can prove that no one right. has ever done this, then I can right. write about the one case it did happen." Absolutely, you know? absolutely, I agree, I agree, and that's that's the whole embodiment of fiction. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So <laughs> I agree with you. I don't want to read about real life. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We should Thanks. all have a full word that says, I made this shit up. Yeah. <laughs> it's called fiction on purpose. <laughs> there's a reason. You're here. <laughs> How are you, CD? Wow, you guys just, you know, you've said it all, and I agree with everything you're saying. And I am fangirling a little bit. I realize I have most of you on my Kindle, and <laughs> I've read you. <laughs> so you guys rock. You're awesome. <laughs> Um, I think one of the most difficult things just writing any genre is pleasing these hardcore fans who, let's face it, ladies, they beat us up if we don't get it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, that that is a constant pressure. I think we all kind of feel. And hopefully, you know, I do okay. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, so we're pretty much at the top of the hour, and there were a couple more questions that popped into the chat, but we're running low on time. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so I guess we'll close out and we'll see um, if any of the authors would like to, if you have any giveaways, if you want to talk about them or if you want to talk about projects that you have coming up or anything else that you'd like to close with. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming and like to thank the viewers for coming in too. So we'll start with you, Marian. Um, well, I am starting a cozy mystery series under the name of Mary Ann Danbury, and there will be a lot of history in that. Um, but I also am just about finished writing uh, a uh, a story in the Magic and Mayhem uh, universe uh, because Robin Peterman, how, who is absolutely amazing, has invited me into her into her world, and I get to play in her sandbox for a little bit. And it's called um, Big Girls Don't Scry. Um, so. It's uh, it's been a lot of fun to try and, and get away from my dark histories and to write a little bit lighter and funnier. So that's uh, what's coming up. But um, uh, if if you want a uh, an audio code for Hollow's End, which is the beginning of it's book one in the Legend series, and it is. Um, it is a team book, so there's there's no sex in it. Lots of sexual sexual tension and criminal mischief and so forth. But it does open the series. Um, I have audio codes. Um, I don't have too many, so it'll be first come first serve. So if you want this, just hit me up on Facebook with a a, a, a message. I'll put the link in the in the group, um, and uh, you can let me know. Okay, thank you, Hildy. I have a um, free book that I'll be giving away. I will post it in the comments. It's going to be the first book in the Clan Ross series, and I'll be giving away a few copies of that. And it'll be also first come, first serve. And it's uh, Heartless Layered, and this is his brother, Tristan. He's not being given away, but you can get to know <laughs> him. <if you're laughs> <real. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and I am still working on this Clan Ross series, so we have a few more books coming out. But the next one comes out on the 23rd, which is next week. So keep an eye out for that. Follow me on Facebook and all those Instagram. And who's, who's your publisher of those books, Hildy? It's this really nice lady who has a sword and a dagger in it, Dragon Blade. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to upset her. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. My next book in the Clan Ross series is coming out next week, and it's called The Hellish Highlander, and it's his little brother. Ooh. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. All right, Caroline. Okay, I have to give a shout out to Dragon Blade Publishing, too. Woohoo! Okay, the first, I've got a series with, of Highlanders with them. The first one, The Sinclair Hound, is 99 cents. Um, 
I will post, I'll post links. Um, I did, I shared the Bruce's Angel, which is the first in the Highland Angel series. This book is free on any platform. So if, if I don't post the link, you just search this one. I want to tell you about the series that I'm doing right now, though, just really quick, because the next one, the first one just came out. The next one comes out soon. It's called The Hots for Scots. Okay. The first book that just came out is called A Scott Mess. And the next one's coming out, Scott on her trail. I've got in Scott water. They are, I find them hilarious. Presumably, I mean, if, if you if you have my sense of humor, this is a series of um, madcap hijinks, comedy of errors, uh, two uh, identical twins fall in love with two other identical twins, ridiculous identity crisis, um, ensues. There's all sorts of anachronistic jokes and s silly secondary characters. I set out to write a series that we're, the world is kind of messed up right now and we all need to laugh. And the reviewers are saying that uh, a Scott mess, the one that just came out is hilarious, laugh out loud, exactly what they need at this time. Uh, and I don't have it in paperback to show you because it literally just came out. But it's a really fun series. The series, again, is called The Hots for Scots. And it's it's just a really fun, easy to read. All of my books are in Kindle Unlimited, if that helps. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, let's see. You can find me at www.catherinelevesque.com. And if you sign up for my blog um you will be entered to win a 25 dollar amazon gift certificate i do this every month so you can find me on my website you can find me on amazon every single book i have is in kindle unlimited in august i have a, a new series coming out with source books called highland gladiator um that's the first book anyway um and that one's coming out in august um i just had a new release this week called wolfheart about part of the dual pack series it is actually book 16 so you can pick that up right now. It's still 99 cents. It is a big book. Um, you can pick that up on Amazon. And um, thank you very much for joining us today. I think it was really, this was a really fun chat. I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed Caroline. I enjoyed Hildy and, and everybody else. And it's, it's just been really a lot of fun, you guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Catherine. Um, how about you, CD? So in the comments, I did post a link to my raffle copter. It's also in the Romancing the Capital group. I'm giving away a $20 Amazon gift card. Um, I actually just had a new release yesterday in Millie Taden's PDA world. Perfectly wrapped. Just came out. I have a couple of new things coming out in May. If you want to look at them, you can just check out my website, www.cdgory.com. Thank you guys for including me today. This was a whole lot of fun. Great. Thanks for coming, everyone. It was a lot of fun. Um, the next panel coming up will be Shapeshifter Romance. And I will oh. be there. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thanks. Thank Bye, everyone. You. Bye, everyone. <laughs>